Welcome to this short stories video and we'll look at the most dangerous game by Richard Connell. There'll be context, the audiobook which you can follow along and extra analysis from myself. So first of all I have a bunch of images, um, book covers and TV posters or movie posters for the most dangerous game. Based on these, what do you think the book might be about? Uh, what do you think the conflict might be? Where might the setting be? Uh, what type of subgenre could it be? What do you think might happen? Any symbols? You know, I, I, I try and have a really good prediction about the story based on these and let me know what you think. So moving on to context then. The book was written by Richard Connell in, in 1924. This is important because it was just after the First World War, in which Connell actually fought himself in France. Now, the First World War was is known as the Great War. It is a horrible war. It's uh, trench warfare was what was common. Basically, people would dig these trenches, dig these uh, lines and holes, and they would climb over and run towards the other side. Uh, the other side would have machine guns, so people would just get gunned down. It was a very, very brutal war. And it is likely that uh, Connell's experience did shape the way he wrote, particularly this story. Uh, Connell was one of the most popular short story authors of his time, and he was also a journalist. Now, the story has been retold many times over the years, and I thought you might want to know there's actually a new TV show um, starring Liam Hemsworth, um, Chris Hemsworth, Thor's brother, and Christoph Waltz, and that'll be on a streaming site called Quibbly. Now, I also have to let you know a little bit about Russia, the Cossacks, and the Revolution. So the Cossacks are a group of people from Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, they're known for being really good at fighting, basically. They, they're on horses, they're really good at um, with use of weapons, they're known for being the best fighters. Now, they sign a treaty with the Tsar. The Tsar, these guys here, they are the rulers, or they were the rulers of Russia, uh, like the emperors almost. Um, the Cossacks were often downtrodden people. Uh, they were bullied a bit by Russia and Poland. So in exchange for some more agency and autonomy, um, they, the Tsar said to the, the Cossacks, look, if you protect me and you protect my family, uh, we'll let you have some more power, basically. And the Cossacks were sent to stop revolutionaries and mini revolutions all throughout the 19th and the 20th century. So Russia was a very unequal society. The rich had a lot. The rich had loads and the poor had nothing. Often the poor would starve. I'm not going to go too much into too much detail. I'm not a history teacher. Um, but in 1917, the Bolsheviks overthrew the Tsar. Uh, this was part of a communist revolution. And they established the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republic, or the Soviet Union. So the communists took power, the Bolsheviks took power, and they kicked out the Tsars and killed many people and basically got a bit of revenge. And the Cossacks had to go into exile for this, um, for being killed or imprisoned by the new regime for helping the Tsars, basically. And this is actually important because it, it, it there is some relation, I think, to one of the big quotes and therefore a theme in the story, possibly. And I'll talk about that in two seconds. But first, hunting game. Now, the book itself is wordplay. The most dangerous game has two meanings. Game can be like a sport, like you're playing a game, playing football, playing cricket, whatever, playing Xbox. But game is also animals which are hunted. So moose, deer, bears, these are all game. So the most dangerous game is the most dangerous sport to play, but also the most dangerous animal to hunt. And before I finish, I just want to talk about this quote from the novel, from the short story. The world is made up of two classes, the hunters and the hunties. Now, some interpretations of this might be that the world is made up of classes, economic classes, rich and poor, those with and those without, and those with often tread on and take from those without. That could be one interpretation, especially as you read this story. So really try to think about that and think of the context. You've got the Russian, uh, the uh, communist revolution and all of this is important. So see if you can find any other examples where it could have a mean, an interpretation of the rich treading on the poor, basically taken from the poor. Uh, when you read this short story, though, there are some things I really want you to focus on. So what are the themes? What messages can you spot? 
How is nature described? Nature in particular, and what devices are used to describe nature? Why is that important? What does that develop? Also, how is the castle described? How might that develop a theme as well? What do the symbols represent? I want you to look at colours, the castle, jungle, night, the island. What do they represent? And finally, what conflicts can you spot? How are they resolved? And how do the protagonist uh, differ? How does the protagonist differ in the exposition, the beginning of the story, where we set up the characters' motivations, who they are, the setting, versus the denouement or the revo- uh, the resolution? Wow, what's different there? I also look at how um, action increases and rises, and how the conflicts are resolved. So I hope you enjoy the story. It is a long one. This is the longest of all the short stories in the collection. So prepare for a bit of time. But good luck. I hope you enjoy it. The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell Off there to the right, somewhere, is a large island, said Whitney. It's rather a mystery. What island is it? Rainsford asked. The old charts call it Ship Trap Island, Whitney replied. A suggestive name, isn't it? Sailors have a curious dread of the place. I don't know why. Some superstition. I can't see it, remarked Rainsford, trying to peer through the dank tropical night that was palpable as it pressed its thick warm blackness in upon the yacht. You've good eyes, said Whitney with a laugh. And I've seen you pick off a moose moving in the brown fall bush at 400 yards. But even you can't see four miles or so through a moonless Caribbean night. Nor four yards, admitted Rainsford. Ugh, it's like moist black velvet. It'll be light enough in Rio, promised Whitney. We should make it in a few days. I hope the Jaguar guns have come from Purdy's. We should have some good hunting up the Amazon. Great sport, hunting. The best sport in the world, agreed Rainsford. For the hunter, amended Whitney, not for the Jaguar. Don't talk rot, Whitney, said Rainsford. You're a big game hunter, not a philosopher. Who cares how a Jaguar feels? Perhaps the Jaguar does, observed Whitney. Bah! They have no understanding. Even so, I rather think they understand one thing. Fear. The fear of pain and the fear of death. Nonsense, laughed Rainsford. This hot weather is making you soft, Whitney. Be a realist. The world is made up of two classes, the hunters and the huntees. Luckily, you and I are hunters. You think we've passed that island yet? I can't tell in the dark. I hope so. Why? asked Rainsford. The place has a reputation. A bad one. Cannibals? suggested Rainsford. Hardly. Even cannibals wouldn't live in such a godforsaken place. But it's gotten into sailor lore somehow. Didn't you notice that the crew's nerves seemed a bit jumpy today? They were a bit strange now you mention it. Even Captain Nielsen. Yes, even that tough-minded old Swede would go up to the devil himself and ask him for a light. Those fishy blue eyes held a look I never saw there before. All I could get out of him was, This place has an evil name among seafaring men, sir. Then he said to me, very gravely, Don't you feel anything? As if the air about us was actually poisonous. Now, you mustn't laugh when I tell you this. I did feel something like a sudden chill. There was no breeze. The sea was as flat as a plate glass window. We were drawing near the island then. What I felt was a a mental chill. A sort of sudden dread. Pure imagination, said Rainsford. One superstitious sailor can taint the whole ship's company with fear. Maybe, but sometimes I think sailors have an extra sense that tells them when they're in danger. Sometimes I think evil is a tangible thing, with wavelengths, just as sound and light have. An evil place can, so to speak, broadcast vibrations of evil. Anyhow, I'm glad we're getting out of this zone. Well, I think I'll turn in now, Rainsford. I'm not sleepy, said Rainsford. I'm going to smoke another pipe up on the afterdeck. Good night, then, Rainsford. See you at breakfast. Right. Good night, Whitney. There was no sound in the night as Rainsford sat there, but the muffled throb of the engine that drove the yacht swiftly through the darkness, and the swish and ripple of the wash of the propeller. Rainsford, reclining in a steamer chair, indolently puffed on his favorite briar. The sensuous drowsiness of the night was on him. 
It's so dark, he thought, that I could sleep without closing my eyes. The night would be my eyelids. An abrupt sound startled him. Off to the right he heard it, and his ears, expert in such matters, could not be mistaken. Again he heard the sound, and again. Somewhere, off in the blackness, someone had fired a gun three times. Rainsford sprang up and moved quickly to the rail, mystified. He strained his eyes in the direction from which the reports had come, but it was like trying to see through a blanket. He leaped up on the rail and balanced himself there to get greater elevation. His pipe, striking a rope, was knocked from his mouth. He lunged for it. A short, hoarse cry came from his lips as he realized he had reached too far and had lost his balance. The cry was pinched off short as the blood-warm waters of the Caribbean Sea doused over his head. He struggled up to the surface and tried to cry out, but the wash from the speeding yacht slapped him in the face and the salt water in his open mouth made him gag and strangle. Desperately, he struck out with strong strokes after the receding lights of the yacht, but he stopped before he had swum fifty feet. A certain cool-headedness had come to him. It was not the first time he had been in a tight place. There was a chance that his cries could be heard by someone aboard the yacht, but that chance was slender and grew more slender as the yacht raced on. He wrestled himself out of his clothes and shouted with all his power. The lights of the yacht became faint and ever-vanishing fireflies. Then they were blotted out entirely by the night. Rainsford remembered the shots. They had come from the right, and doggedly he swam in that direction, swimming with slow, deliberate strokes, conserving his strength. For a seemingly endless time he fought the sea. He began to count his strokes. He could do possibly a hundred more, and then... Rainsford heard a sound. It came out of the darkness, a high screaming sound, the sound of an animal in an extremity of anguish and terror. He did not recognize the animal that made the sound. He did not try to. With fresh vitality, he swam toward the sound. He heard it again. Then it was cut short by another noise. Crisp. Staccato. Pistol shot, muttered Rainsford, swimming on. So after reading the first page of The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell, we're already uh, seeing the exposition uh, where we introduce the setting and the characters. Now the protagonist of this story, the main character who we focus on, is a chap called Rainsford. Now he's a hunter. Uh, the exposition sets up that he's on his way to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. He's going to go hunting Jaguar in the Amazon. Now, how is Rainsford characterised in the beginning? He's shown to be quite an apathetic person. He doesn't really care about the animals he kills or animals he hunts. He says things like, who cares how a jaguar feels? But they've got no understanding. And uh, when his friend says, you know, I, I think they fear, I think they fear pain, I think they fear death, he laughs and he's like, nonsense. So Rainsford's characterised as a bit of an apathetic person who doesn't care or empathise with the animals he kills. Um, we also see uh, lots of imagery describing where they are, um, particularly the night time. So the night is described with lots of uh, beautiful imagery that really allows us to picture the scene. Um, you know, there's similes, there's metaphors, there's personification. It's called a dank tropical night. Dank has very negative connotations. Um, it's pressed, it's thick, warm blackness upon the yacht. It's like black velvet, he says. Um, one of the other sailors says it's like the air was actually poisonous. There's no breeze, the sea was as flat as a plate glass window. So there's lots of imagery describing nature and particularly the night. Um, there was no sound in the night as Rainford sat there, but the muffled throb of the engine that drove past the yacht swiftly through the darkness and the swish ripple of the wash of the propeller. Again, lots of beautiful imagery uh, that allows us to really picture the scene. The se sensuous drowsiness of the night was on him. I could sleep without closing the night. Uh, my eyes, the night would be my eyelids again. What do you think the night could symbolize? Just track how the night is described throughout the story. Is it described positively or negatively? It was like trying to see for a blanket, he says. And he describes the, um, the waters as blood warm. Now what happens here is they're obviously sailing to Brazil. Um, something happens, he, hears a, he goes to smoke his pipe, he hears a gunshot, it startles him and he falls overboard. 
Um, the wash of the speed of the yacht slapped him in the face. It's also personification, describing nature in this story. Why do you think that could be? What do you think? There are several conflicts in the story. What could one of the conflicts be? Um, so he's stuck in the water and he starts to swim towards where he had the gunshots. He swims towards the island. He fought the sea. Again, more personification. Nature is described as quite brutal. Uh, the lights of the yacht became ever fa vanishing fireflies that were blotted out entirely by the night. So, like I say, really try to keep track of how nature is described, how the night is described. Think about what the night could symbolize, what might its importance be. And there's one quote I really want to highlight on this page. The world is made up of two classes. The hunters, those who hunt, and the huntees, those who are hunted. Just keep this quote in your minds. Ten minutes of determined effort brought another sound to his ears, the most welcome he had ever heard, the muttering and growling of the sea breaking on a rocky shore. He was almost on the rocks before he saw them. On a night less calm, he would have been shattered against them. With his remaining strength, he dragged himself from the swirling waters. Jagged crags appeared to jut up into the opaqueness. He forced himself upward, hand over hand. Gasping, his hands raw, he reached a flat place at the top. Dense jungle came down to the very edge of the cliffs. What perils that tangle of trees and underbrush might hold for him did not concern Rainsford just then. All he knew was that he was safe from his enemy, the sea, and that utter weariness was on him. He flung himself down at the jungle edge and tumbled headlong into the deepest sleep of his life. When he opened his eyes, he knew from the position of the sun that it was late in the afternoon. Sleep had given him new vigor. A sharp hunger was picking at him. He looked about him, almost cheerfully. Where there are pistol shots, there are men. Where there are men, there is food, he thought. But what kind of men, he wondered, in so forbidding a place? An unbroken front of snarled and ragged jungle fringed the shore. He saw no sign of a trail through the closely knit web of weeds and trees. It was easier to go along the shore, and Rainsford floundered along by the water. Not far from where he landed, he stopped. Some wounded thing, by the evidence a large animal, had thrashed about in the underbrush. The jungle weeds were crushed down, and the moss was lacerated. One patch of weeds was stained crimson. A small, glittering object not far away caught Rainsford's eye, and he picked it up. It was an empty cartridge. A twenty-two, he remarked. That's odd. Must have been a fairly large animal, too. The hunter had his nerve with him to tackle it with a light gun. It's clear that the brute put up a fight. I suppose the first three shots I heard was when the hunter flushed his quarry and wounded it. The last shot was when he trailed it here and finished it. He examined the ground closely and found what he had hoped to find, the print of hunting boots. They pointed along the cliff in the direction he had been going. Eagerly, he hurried along, now slipping on a rotten log or a loose stone, but making headway. Night was beginning to settle down on the island. Bleak darkness was blacking out the sea and jungle when Rainsford sighted the lights. He came upon them as he turned a crook in the coastline, and his first thought was that he had come upon a village, for there were many lights. But as he forged along, he saw to his great astonishment that all the lights were in one enormous building, a lofty structure with pointed towers plunging upward into the gloom. His eyes made out the shadowy outlines of a palatial chateau, it was set on a high bluff, and on three sides of it, cliffs dived down to where the sea licked greedy lips in the shadows. Mirage, thought Rainsford. But it was no mirage he found when he opened the tall spiked iron gate. The stone steps were real enough. The massive door with a leering gargoyle for a knocker was real enough. Yet above it all hung an air of unreality. He lifted the knocker, and it crept up stiffly, as if it had never before been used. He let it fall, and it startled him with its booming loudness. He thought he heard steps within. The door remained closed. Again, Rainsford lifted the heavy knocker and let it fall. The door opened then, opened as suddenly as if it were on a spring, and Rainsford stood blinking in the river of glaring gold light that poured out. The first thing Rainsford's eyes discerned was the largest man Rainsford had ever seen, a gigantic creature, solidly made and black-bearded to the waist. In his hand, the man held a long-barreled revolver, and he was pointing it straight at Rainsford's heart. Out of the snarl of beard, two small eyes regarded Rainsford. 
Don't be alarmed, said Rainsford, with a smile which he hoped was disarming. I'm no robber. I fell off a yacht. My name is Sanger Rainsford of New York City. The menacing look in the eyes did not change, the revolver pointing as rigidly as if the giant were a statue. He gave no sign that he understood Rainsford's words, or that he had even heard them. He was dressed in uniform, a black uniform trimmed with gray astrakhan. I'm Sanger Rainsford of New York, Rainsford began again. I fell off a yacht. I am hungry. The man's only answer was to raise with his thumb the hammer of his revolver. Then Rainsford saw the man's free hand go to his forehead in a military salute, and he saw him click his heels together and stand at attention. Another man was coming down the broad marble steps, an erect, slender man in evening clothes. He advanced to Rainsford and held out his hand. In a cultivated voice marked by a slight accent that gave it added precision and deliberateness, he said, It is a very great pleasure and honor to welcome Mr. Sanger Rainsford, the celebrated hunter, to my home. Automatically, Rainsford shook the man's hand. I read your book about hunting snow leopards in Tibet, you see, explained the man. I am General Zaroff. Rainsford's first impression was that the man was singularly handsome. His second was that there was an original, almost bizarre quality about the general's face. He was a tall man past middle age, for his hair was vivid white, but his thick eyebrows and pointed military mustache were as black as the night from which Rainsford had come. His eyes, too, were black and very bright. He had high cheekbones, a sharp-cut nose, a spare, dark face, the face of a man used to giving orders, the face of an aristocrat. Turning to the giant in uniform, the general made a sign. The giant put away his pistol, saluted, withdrew. Ivan is an incredibly strong fellow, remarked the general, but he has the misfortune to be deaf and dumb. A simple fellow, but I'm afraid, like all his race, a bit of a savage. Is he Russian? He is a cassock, said the general, and his smile showed red lips and pointed teeth. So am I. Come, he said. We shouldn't be chatting here. We can talk later. Now you want clothes, food, rest. You shall have them. This is a most restful spot. Ivan had reappeared, and the general spoke to him with lips that moved but gave forth no sound. So as I said, really focus on and pay attention to how the setting, how the scenery, uh, nature is described in this story. Look at the imagery. Um, there is lots of personification, the muttering and the growling of the sea. He was safe from his enemy, the sea. Um, an unbroken front of snarled, a ragged jungle snarling. It's very... Uh, is animal imagery um, what's important about all of this bleak darkness was blocking uh, blacking out the sea in the jungle uh, the sea licked greedy lips in the shadows what is important about this description of nature could it be that nature is one of the conflicts in the story and that Rainsford must overcome this natural conflict um, as well, let's see how Rainsford is described here. He forced himself upward hand over hand. Uh, he knew, he says things like, well, there are pistol shots, there are many. He's obviously a very resourceful character. He is clearly a skilled hunter. Uh, he knew the gun, a 22, 22 being a type of gun, uh, or a type of bullet size, basically. 22, that's all, it must have been a fairly large animal. So he's characterized as this very resourceful character. I also want to highlight one thing, um, where he finds this spot where an animal was clearly killed, um, he says that the weeds were stained crimson. Now crimson is a word, uh, it's a red colour, but it is going to be used again in the story. And the red does begin to symbolise something, so keep an eye out for that. Anyway, Rainsford finds this big lofty structure uh, towards... Uh, towers plunging upward into the gloom. So how is this big palatial chateau, this big um, palace-like castle described? It's a very gothic description. There's a spiked iron gate. There's a gargoyle knocker. Um, if any of you know what like gothic architecture looks like, that comes to mind. Uh, Google it if you don't. Um, and he knocks on the door and this big old creature comes out. Um, it snarls again animal imagery this creature snarls and this is General Zaroff's uh, right-hand man basically he's kind of butler 
and eventually we're introduced to the antagonist, General Zaroff. Um, see how he's described, see how he's characterized. Um, obviously his right hand man, his butler, is very respectful towards him, he salutes him as he comes down the stairs. Um, compare that to how the inside of his house is described when he opens the door it's like glaring gold light a river pouring out in, uh, at him the man is dressed in evening clothes and he has he's described as aristocratic but see how else his physical description is described uh, whilst he is singularly handsome he has these big thick black eyebrows and a pointy moustache as black as the night from which Rainsford had come so think how the night's described is it described positively or negatively and then consider that this chap's eyebrows and moustache are described with the same blackness uh, could this blackness symbolize something his eyes too were black uh, he had high cheekbones um, a sharp cut nose and uh, he's also his smile showed red lips and pointed teeth now this actually makes me think of two famous story characters. Well, one of them's real, one of them's from a story. Um, Dracula, on the left, from Bram Stoker's novel. And on the right, the character whom Dracula was actually based on, Vlad the Impaler, a real Transylvanian leader who used to impale people on spikes. He'd put a spike up you, stand it upright, and you would slowly fall down and be impaled over several days. And he did this to many people. Um, Obviously, both of these people, the character Dracula and Vlad the Impaler, are not very nice people. And the illusion, the sort of description that alludes to these characters, kind of already foreshadows that General Zaroff is going to be a bit of a nasty character. He's also shown to be a bit racist as well. He says, a simple fill, I'm afraid, like all of his race, a bit of a savage when describing his butler, who is a Cossack um, is a member of people from the Ukraine and southern Russia. Um, but he does speak very politely, and you should also note that, that he, you know, he speaks very formally, um, and he is described as a bit of an aristocrat. So keep that in mind as well. Follow Ivan, if you please, Mr. Rainsford, said the general. I was about to have my dinner when you came. I'll wait for you. You'll find that my clothes will fit you, I think. It was to a huge, beam-ceilinged bedroom with a canopied bed big enough for six men that Rainsford followed the silent giant. Ivan laid out an evening suit, and Rainsford, as he put it on, noticed that it came from a London tailor who ordinarily cut and sewed for none below the rank of Duke. The dining room to which Ivan conducted him was in many ways remarkable. There was a medieval magnificence about it. It suggested a baronial hall of feudal times, with its oaken panels, its high ceiling, its vast refectory tables where two score men could sit down to eat. About the hall were mounted heads of many animals, lions, tigers, elephants, moose, bears, larger or more perfect specimens Rainford had never seen. At the great table, the general was sitting alone. "'You'll have a cocktail, Mr. Rainsford,' he suggested." The cocktail was surpassingly good, and, Rainsford noted, the table appointments were of the finest, the linen, the crystal, the silver, the china. They were eating borscht, the rich red soup with whipped cream so dear to Russian palates. Half apologetically, General Zaroff said, We do our best to preserve the amenities of civilization here. Please forgive any lapses. We are well off the beaten track, you know. Do you think the champagne has suffered from its long ocean trip? Not in the least, declared Rainsford. He was finding the general a most thoughtful and affable host, a true cosmopolite. But there was one small trait of the general's that made Rainsford uncomfortable. Whenever he looked up from his plate, he found the general studying him, appraising him narrowly. Perhaps, said General Zaroff, you were surprised that I recognized your name. You see, I read all books on hunting published in English, French, and Russian. I have but one passion in my life, Mr. Rainsford, and it is the hunt. You have some wonderful heads here, said Rainsford, as he ate particularly well-cooked filet mignon. That Cape Buffalo is the largest I ever saw. Oh, that fellow. Yes, he was a monster. Did he charge you? Curled me against a tree, said the general. Fractured my skull, but I got the brute. I've always thought, said Rainsford, 
that the Cape Buffalo is the most dangerous of all big game. For a moment, the general did not reply. He was smiling his curious red-lipped smile. Then he said slowly, No, you are wrong, sir. The Cape Buffalo is not the most dangerous big game. He sipped his wine. Here in my preserve on this island, he said in the same slow tone, I hunt more dangerous game. Rainsford expressed his surprise. Is there big game on this island? The general nodded. The biggest. Really? Oh, it isn't here naturally, of course. I have to stock the island. What have you imported, general? Rainsford asked. Tigers? The general smiled. No, he said. Hunting tigers ceased to interest me some years ago. I exhausted their possibilities, you see. No thrill left in tigers. No, no real danger. I live for danger, Mr. Rainsford. The general took from his pocket a gold cigarette case and offered his guest a long black cigarette with a silver tip. It was perfumed and gave off a smell like incense. We will have some capital hunting, you and I, said the general. I shall be most glad to have your society. But what game, began Rainsford. I'll tell you, said the general. You will be amused, I know. I think I may say, in all modesty, that I have done a rare thing. I have invented a new sensation. May I pour you another glass of port? Thank you, general. The general filled both glasses and said, God makes some men poets. Some he makes kings, some beggars. Me, he made a hunter. My hand was made for the trigger, my father said. He was a very rich man with a quarter of a million acres in the Crimea, and he was an ardent sportsman. When I was only five years old, he gave me a little gun, specially made in Moscow for me, to shoot sparrows with. When I shot some of his prized turkeys with it, he did not punish me. He complimented me on my marksmanship. I killed my first bear in the Caucasus when I was ten. My whole life has been one prolonged hunt. I went into the army, it was expected of noblemen's sons, and for a time commanded a division of Cossack cavalry. But my real interest was always the hunt. I have hunted every kind of game in every land. It would be impossible for me to tell you how many animals I've killed. The general puffed at his cigarette. After the debacle in Russia, I left the country, for it was imprudent for an officer of the Tsar to stay there. Many noble Russians lost everything. I, luckily, had invested heavily in American securities, so I shall never have to open a tea room in Monte Carlo or drive a taxi in Paris. Naturally, I continued to hunt. Grizzlies in your Rockies, crocodiles in the Ganges, rhinoceroses in East Africa. It was in Africa that the Cape Buffalo hit me and laid me up for six months. As soon as I recovered, I started for the Amazon to hunt jaguars, for I had heard they were unusually cunning. They weren't. The Cossack sighed. They were no match at all for a hunter with his wits about him and a high-powered rifle. I was bitterly disappointed. I was lying in my tent with a splitting headache one night when a terrible thought pushed its way into my mind. Hunting was beginning to bore me. And hunting, remember, had been my life. I have heard that in America, businessmen often go to pieces when they give up the business that has been their life. Yes, that's so, said Rainsford. The general smiled. I had no wish to go to pieces, he said. I must do something. Now... Mine is an analytical mind, Mr. Rainsford. Doubtless, that is why I enjoy the problems of the chase. No doubt, General Zaroff. So, continued the general, I asked myself why the hunt no longer fascinated me. You are much younger than I am, Mr. Rainsford, and have not hunted as much. But perhaps you can guess the answer. What was it? Simply this. Hunting had ceased to be what you call... A sporting proposition. It had become too easy. I always got my query. Always. There is no greater bore than perfection. The general lit a fresh cigarette. So it's not just the way General Zaroff acts and speaks that characterizes him as this kind of, characterizes him as this kind of posh, wealthy, aristocratic person, but you know, just his house and the items in it also characterise him like this. Like, he leaves out a suit for Rainsford that 
he's from a London tailor who ordinary, who usually just cut suits for dukes. Um, the table fits 40 people on it. Uh, it's beautiful tableware. It's described as a baronial hall. Um, there's the finest crystal, linen, silver, and china. So the the elegance of the the house or the chateau kind of characterizes uh, General Zaroff as this mysterious, wealthy person. Shut up, Siri. Um, also, look at the what's mounted on the walls. You've got heads of lions, tigers, elephants, moose, and bears. You know, we're already starting to foreshadow something, and they're eating something called borscht, which is a thick red soup from Russia uh, and Eastern Europe. Now, what could this thick red soup symbolize? Remember, red is starting to become a symbolic color in the story. They're also drinking port, which is a red wine. Uh, Rainsford feels a bit uncomfortable as well because he notices that General Zaroff is studying him. And he's obviously a bit of a avid hunter. He loves hunting himself. He keeps talking about how he's hunted um, tigers, and even they weren't thrilling to him. He hunted um, buffalo. He also went to uh, America to hunt grizzly bears, crocodiles in the Ganges, rhinos, and even am the Amazon to hunt jaguars, which, remember, that's where Rainsford was going. So there's a connection between the two characters here. And they talk about hunting the most dangerous game. Now, the most dangerous game is uh, a bit of a pun. Obviously, game is like a sport. You know, you can play a game like you'd play a sport. But game also refers to the animals which people hunt. So the most dangerous game has two meanings here. Um, and you can kind of see where this is going. What do you think by this page, the most dangerous game, the most dangerous sport, and the most dangerous thing to hunt could be bear in mind he's hunted all the animals and they were no fun and he describes himself as this like a soldier who fought in the war um was a great marksman um so what do you think where do you think this is going also pay attention to the quote at the bottom there is no greater bore than perfection what do you think that means no animal had a chance with me anymore that is no boast, it is a mathematical certainty. The animal had nothing but his legs and his instinct. Instinct is no match for reason. When I thought of this, it was a tragic moment for me, I can tell you. Rainsford leaned across the table, absorbed in what his host was saying. It came to me as an inspiration what I must do, the general went on. And that was... The general smiled, the quiet smile of one who has faced an obstacle and surmounted it with success. I had to invent a new animal to hunt, he said. A new animal? You're joking. Not at all, said the general. I never joke about hunting. I needed a new animal. I found one. So I bought this island, built this house, and here I do my hunting. The island is perfect for my purposes. There are jungles with a maze of trails in them, hills, swamps. But the animal, General Zaroff? Oh, said the general. It supplies me with the most exciting hunting in the world. No other hunting compares with it for an instant. Every day I hunt, and I never grow bored now, for I have a query with which I can match my wits. Rainsford's bewilderment showed on his face. I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, explained the general. So I said, what are the attributes of an ideal query? And the answer was, of course, it must have courage, cunning, and above all, it must be able to reason. But no animal can reason, objected Rainsford. My dear fellow, said the general, there is one that can. But you can't mean, gasped Rainsford. And why not? I can't believe you're serious, General Zaroff. This is a grisly joke. Why should I not be serious? I am speaking of hunting. Hunting? Great guns, General Zaroff. What did you speak of is murder. The general laughed with entire good nature. He regarded Rainsford quizzically. I refuse to believe that so modern and civilized a young man as you seem to be harbors romantic ideas about the value of human life. Surely your experiences in the war did not make me condone cold-blooded murder, finished Rainsford stiffly. Laughter shook the general. 
How extraordinarily droll you are, he said. One does not expect nowadays to find a young man of the educated class, even in America, with such a naive and, if I may say so, mid-Victorian point of view. It's like finding a snuff box in a limousine. Ah, well, doubtless you had Puritan ancestors. So many Americans appear to have had. I'll wager you'll forget your notions when you go hunting with me. You have a genuine new thrill in store for you, Mr. Rainsford. Thank you. I'm a hunter, not a murderer. Dear me, said the general, quite unruffled. Again, that unpleasant word. But I think I can show you that your scruples are quite ill-founded. Yes? Life is for the strong, to be lived by the strong, and, if needs be, taken by the strong. The weak of the world were put here to give the strong pleasure. I am strong. Why should I not use my gift? If I wish to hunt, why should I not? I hunt the scum of the earth. Sailors from tramp ships, lassers, blacks, Chinese, whites, mongrels. A thoroughbred horse or hound is worth more than a score of them. But they are men, said Rainsford hotly. Precisely, said the general. That is why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They can reason, after a fashion. So they are dangerous. But where do you get them? The general's left eyelid fluttered down in a wink. This island is called Ship Trap, he answered. Sometimes an angry god of the high seas sends them to me. Sometimes, when Providence is not so kind, I help Providence a bit. Come to the window with me. Rainsford went to the window and looked out toward the sea. Watch, out there, exclaimed the general, pointing into the night. Rainsford's eyes saw only blackness, and then, as the general pressed a button, far out to sea Rainsford saw the flash of lights. The general chuckled. They indicate a channel, he said, where there's none. Giant rocks with razor edges crouch like a sea monster with wide open jaws. They can crush a ship as easily as I crush this nut. He dropped a walnut on the hardwood floor and brought his heel grinding down on it. Oh yes, he said casually, as if in answer to a question. I have electricity. We try to be civilized here. Civilized? And you shoot down men? A trace of anger was in the general's black eyes, but it was there for but a second, and he said in his most pleasant manner, Dear me, what a righteous young man you are. I assure you I do not do the thing that you suggest. That would be barbarous. I treat these visitors with every consideration. They get plenty of good food and exercise. They get into splendid physical condition. You shall see for yourself tomorrow. What do you mean? We'll visit my training school, smiled the general. It's in the cellar. I have about a dozen pupils down there now. They're from the Spanish bark San Lucar that had the bad luck to go on the rocks out there. A very inferior lot, I regret to say. Poor specimens and more accustomed to the deck than to the jungle. He raised his hand, and Ivan, who served as a waiter, brought thick Turkish coffee. Rainsford, with an effort, held his tongue in check. "'It's a game, you see,' pursued the general blandly. "'I suggest to one of them that we go hunting. I give him a supply of food and an excellent hunting knife. I give him three hours' start. I am to follow, armed only with a pistol of the smallest caliber and range. If my quarry eludes me for three whole days, he wins the game.' If I find him, the general smiled, he loses. Suppose he refuses to be hunted. Oh, said the general. I give him his option, of course. He need not play that game if he doesn't wish to. If he does not wish to hunt, I turn him over to Ivan. Ivan once had the honor of serving as official nowder to the great white czar, and he has his own ideas of sport. Invariably, Mr. Rainsford, invariably they choose the hunt. And if they win? The smile on... So it is finally revealed on this page that the animal which Rainsford, uh, General Zaroff is talking about is humans. He is hunting humans. And he says that instinct is no match for reason. Let me know if you agree with this. Instinct being something you know, you're just born with it, you don't have to learn it. And reason is obviously logic and thought and learning. Um, he's invented a new animal to hunt, which is humans, but Rainsford opposes this greatly. He disagrees with it massively. He calls it murder, and he 
can't condone this cold-blooded murder, which he refers to. Um, General Zoroff does allude to the fact that Rainsford fought in a war, and so he should surely agree with him. He then points out, you know, like, I thought you would agree with me, but you obviously have a very old-fashioned mind. He uses something called an anachronism, where he says, you know, you're like a snuff box in a limousine. A snuff box is like a jewellery box from the 18th century, and obviously limousines are a lot more modern. So it's something out of place. It doesn't fit in the right time, and this is an anachronism. Um, you know, again, Rainsford massively disagrees. I'm not, a, I'm a hunter. I'm not a murderer. And this is important because this is where we see Rainsford is changing. He is a dynamic character who in the beginning is very apathetic towards animals, um, doesn't care much for the animals he hunts, doesn't believe they fear. And we slowly start to see him change uh, when he's presented with the idea of hunting humans. Uh, General Zorov is characterized as a bit of a horrible person here. He says things like life is for the strong, uh, it needs to be taken by the strong. I'm strong, so therefore I should take lives of the weak. He also is quite racist. Um, he says, you know, he calls people scum of the earth and refers to different ethnic groups. Um, but Rainsford's like, but they are men, he says it hotly. There's some alliteration as well. General Zaroff says, of course, it must have courage and cunning. That cur, cur, cur sound is very angry and forceful, which characterizes General Zaroff as well. The general chuckles when Rainsford disagrees, and um, he shows him how he catches the prey. So he has a big light on the island, which makes it appear that it's safe for ships to go there, but there's actually rocks there. Rocks with razor edges, crouched like a sea monster with wide open jaws. Again, this uh, personification when talking about nature is really important in this story. Um, and we see General Zaroff is really beginning to change. He's becoming a lot more unpleasant. And the way he looks at Rainsford suggests that he's going to actually want to hunt him. And the general's face widened. To date, I have not lost, he said. Then he added hastily, I don't wish you to think me a braggart, Mr. Rainsford. Many of them afford only the most elementary sort of problem. Occasionally I strike a tartar. One almost did win. I eventually had to use the dogs. The dogs? This way, please. I'll show you. The general steered Rainsford to a window. The lights from the windows sent a flickering illumination that made grotesque patterns on the courtyard below, and Rainsford could see moving about there a dozen or so huge black shapes. As they turned toward him, their eyes glittered greenly. A rather good lot, I think, observed the general. They are let out at seven every night. If anyone should try to get into my house, or out of it, something extremely regrettable would occur to him. He hummed a snatch of song from the Folie Bergère. And now, said the general, I want to show you my new collection of heads. Will you come with me to the library? I hope, said Rainsford, that you will excuse me tonight, General Zaroff. I'm really not feeling well. Ah, indeed, the general inquired solicitously. Well, I suppose that's only natural after your long swim. You need a good, restful night's sleep. Tomorrow you'll feel like a new man, I'll wager. Then we'll hunt, eh? I've one rather promising prospect. Rainsford was hurrying from the room. Sorry you can't go with me tonight, called the general. I expect rather fair sport. A big, strong black. He looks resourceful. Well, good night, Mr. Rainsford. I hope you have a good night's rest. The bed was good, and the pajamas of the softest silk and he was tired in every fiber of his being, but nevertheless Rainsford could not quiet his brain with the opiate of sleep. He lay, eyes wide open. Once he thought he heard stealthy steps in the corridor outside his room. He sought to throw open the door. It would not open. He went to the window and looked out. His room was high up in one of the towers. The lights of the chateau were out now, and it was dark and silent. But there was a fragment of sallow moon and by its wan light he could see, dimly, the courtyard. There, weaving in and out of the pattern of shadow, were black, noiseless forms. The hounds heard him at the window and looked up, expectantly, with their green eyes. Rainsford went back to the bed and lay down. By many methods he tried to put himself to sleep. 
He had achieved a doze when, just as morning began to come, he heard, far off in the jungle, the faint report of a pistol. General Zaroff did not appear until luncheon. He was dressed faultlessly in the tweeds of a country squire. He was solicitous about the state of Rainsford's health. "'As for me,' sighed the general, "'I do not feel so well. I am worried, Mr. Rainsford. Last night I detected traces of my old complaint.' To Rainsford's questioning glance, the general said, Ennui. Boredom. Then, taking a second helping of Crepe Suzette, the general explained, The hunting was not good last night. The fellow lost his head. He made a straight trail that offered no problems at all. That's the trouble with these sailors. They have dull brains to begin with, and they do not know how to get about in the woods. They do excessively stupid and obvious things. It's most annoying. "'Will you have another glass of Chablis, Mr. Rainsford?' "'General,' said Rainsford firmly, "'I wish to leave this island at once.' The general raised his thickets of eyebrows. He seemed hurt. "'But, my dear fellow,' the general protested, "'you've only just come. You've had no hunting.' "'I wish to go today,' said Rainsford. He saw the dead black eyes of the general on him, studying him. General Zaroff's face suddenly brightened. He filled Rainsford's glass with venerable Chablis from a dusty bottle. Tonight, said the general, we will hunt, you and I. Rainsford shook his head. No, general, he said, I will not hunt. The general shrugged his shoulders and delicately ate a hothouse grape. As you wish, my friend, he said. The choice rests entirely with you, but may I not venture to suggest that you will find my idea of sport more diverting than Ivan's? He nodded toward the corner to where the giant stood, scowling, his thick arms crossed on his hog's head of chest. "'You don't mean,' cried Rainsford. "'My dear fellow,' said the general, "'have I not told you I always mean what I say about hunting? This is really an inspiration. I drink to a foeman worthy of my steel at last!' The general raised his glass, but Rainsford sat staring at him. "'You'll find this game worth playing,' the general said enthusiastically. Your brain against mine, your woodcraft against mine, your strength and stamina against mine. Outdoor chess, and the stake is not without value, eh? And if I win, began Rainsford huskily, I'll cheerfully acknowledge myself defeat if I do not find you by midnight of the third day, said General Zaroff. My sloop will place you on the mainland near a town. The general read what Rainsford was thinking. Oh, you can trust me, said the Cossack. I will give you my word as a gentleman and a sportsman. Of course, you, in turn, must agree to say nothing of your visit here. I'll agree to nothing of the kind, said Rainsford. Oh, said the general. In that case, but why discuss that now? Three days hence, we can discuss it over a bottle of Veuve Clicquot. Unless... The general sipped his wine. Then a business-like air animated him. Ivan, he said to Rainsford, will supply you with hunting clothes, food, a knife. I suggest you wear moccasins. They leave a poorer trail. I suggest, too, that you avoid the big swamp in the southeast corner of the island. We call it Death Swamp. There's quicksand there. One foolish fellow tried it. The deplorable part of it was that Lazarus followed him. You can imagine my feelings, Mr. Rainsford. I loved Lazarus. He was the finest hound in my pack. Well, I must beg you to excuse me now. I always take a siesta after lunch. You'll hardly have time for a nap, I fear. You'll want to start, no doubt. I shall not follow until dusk. Hunting at night is so much more exciting than by day, don't you think? Au revoir, Mr. Rainsford. Au revoir. General Zaroff, with a deep, courtly bow, strolled from the room. From another door came Ivan. Under one arm he carried khaki hunting clothes, a haversack of food, a leather sheath containing a long-bladed hunting knife. His right hand rested on a cocked revolver thrust in the crimson sash about his waist. So we finally see that Rainsford and General Zaroff will go out. General Zaroff will hunt Rainsford. Now, it doesn't really seem fair either. At the beginning of this page, uh, Zaroff says, I eventually had to use the dogs. You know, that gives him a massive unfair advantage. He has these dogs to track people and hunt with. He also knows the island really well. He knows where the quicksand is. Now, at the beginning of this page, um, 
Gerald Zaroff takes Rainsford to the window and shows him the other men whom he plans to hunt. And they look up and their eyes glittered greenly. Some alliteration there which draws our attention to it. And the green could be symbolic of the fact they're still alive. Green often, you know, connotations with nature and life. Um, and we see Rainsford trying to hurry away on that evening. He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to hunt men. He opposes the idea. He hurries from the room. Uh, eventually he goes to sleep, but he can't sleep very well. He hears someone walking outside stealthily. He tries to open a door, but it won't open. And the next day he goes down for breakfast. The general eventually comes and he sees the dead black eyes. Remember, black is becoming symbolic in this story. The dead black eyes studying generals, um, studying Rainsford. And... Um, and then he offers him to hunt again. Rainsford says no. And then we see the fret finally. I may not venture to suggest that you will find my idea of sport more diverting than Ivan's. Um, basically, you know, you can either be hunted by me or Ivan's just going to kill you. So this is the fret. Another thing I really want to point out in this story is a lot of the medieval imagery. Uh, over here, you can see... Generals are off dressed as a county, a country squire. A squire is a medieval term uh, to do with knights, but also there's a lot of other imagery describing the house, uh, baronial it's called. Um, and medieval times are obviously not so sophisticated. So even though the general is described as being cosmopolitan, well-cultured, well-traveled, he's also slightly and implicitly described as very outdated and you know, not very modern. Uh, they drink a lot of red wine. Again, red is becoming symbolic of something, and I'll highlight that over here. The word crimson is used again. You'll remember from the uh, an earlier page where the blood stained uh, blood stain on the grass was called crimson. Again, here we're saying said the Cossack. They're not calling him the general anymore. The Cossack, which is, uh, as you know, a Russian fighter, Russian a type of Russian soldier, very very good at fighting, very good at war, but it, it can be a very negative term. It does have negative connotations. They're quite, they're seen as quite like aggressive fighters, very animalistic fighters. Um, but it seems that they will be fighting your brain against mine, your craft against mine, your strength and stamina against mine, outdoor chess. So uh, it looks like they're going to be fighting. Now he says, we, you must agree not to say nothing of your visit here. And Rainsford says, I won't agree to that. We see a bit of characterization here. The general says, oh, in that case, oh, don't worry, we'll discuss that later, basically. And it shows he's confident that he will win. He's like, we don't even need to discuss that now. I'm pretty sure I'm going to beat you. Rainsford had fought his way through the bush for two hours. I must keep my nerve. I must keep my nerve, he said through tight teeth. He had not been entirely clear-headed when the chateau gates snapped shut behind him. His whole idea at first was to put distance between himself and General Zaroff, and, to this end, he had plunged along, spurred on by the sharp rowers of something very like panic. Now he had got a grip on himself, had stopped, and was taking stock of himself in the situation. He saw that straight flight was futile. Inevitably, it would bring him face to face with the sea. He was in a picture with a frame of water, and his operations clearly must take place within that frame. I'll give him a trail to follow, muttered Rainsford, and he struck off from the rude path he had been following into the trackless wilderness. He executed a series of intricate loops. He doubled on his trail again and again, recalling all the lure of the fox hunt and all the dodges of the fox. Night found him leg-weary, with hands and face lashed by the branches on a thickly wooded ridge. He knew it would be insane to blunder on through the dark, even if he had the strength. His need for rest was imperative, and he thought, I have played the fox, now I must play the cat of the fable. A big tree with a thick trunk and outspread branches was nearby, and, taking care not to leave the slightest mark, he climbed up into the crotch, and stretching out on one of the broad limbs, after a fashion, rested. Rest brought him new confidence, and almost a feeling of security. Even so zealous a hunter as General Zaroff could not trace him there, he told himself. Only the devil himself could follow that complicated trail through the jungle after dark. But perhaps the general was a devil. 
An apprehensive night crawled slowly by like a wounded snake, and sleep did not visit Rainsford, although the silence of a dead world was on the jungle. Toward morning, when a dingy gray was varnishing the sky, the cry of some startled bird focused Rainsford's attention in that direction. Something was coming through the bush, coming slowly, carefully, coming by the same winding way Rainsford had come. He flattened himself down on the limb, and through a screen of leaves almost as thick as tapestry, he watched. That which was approaching was a man. It was General Zaroff. He made his way along with his eyes fixed in utmost concentration on the ground before him. He paused almost beneath the tree, dropped to his knees, and studied the ground. Rainsford's impulse was to hurl himself down like a panther, but he saw that the general's right hand held something metallic, a small automatic pistol. The hunter shook his head several times, as if he were puzzled. Then he straightened up and took from his case one of his black cigarettes. Its pungent, incense-like smoke floated up to Rainsford's nostrils. Rainsford held his breath. The general's eyes had left the ground and were traveling inch by inch up the tree. Rainsford froze there, every muscle tensed for a spring. But the sharp eyes of the hunter stopped before they reached the limb where Rainsford lay. A smile spread over his brown face. Very deliberately, he blew a smoke ring into the air. Then he turned his back on the tree and walked carelessly away, back along the trail he had come. The swish of the underbrush against his hunting boots grew fainter and fainter. The pent-up air burst hotly from Rainsford's lungs. His first thought made him feel sick and numb. The general could follow a trail through the woods at night. He could follow an extremely difficult trail. He must have uncanny powers. Only by the merest chance had the cassock failed to see his quarry. Rainsford's second thought was even more terrible. It sent a shudder of cold horror through his whole being. Why had the general smiled? Why had he turned back? Rainsford did not want to believe what his reason told him was true, but the truth was as evident as the sun that had now pushed through the morning mists. The general was playing with him. The general was saving him for another day's sport. The Cossack was the cat, he was the mouse. Then it was that Rainsford knew the full meaning of terror. I will not lose my nerve, I will not. He slid down from the tree and struck off again into the woods. His face was set and he forced the machinery of his mind to function. Three hundred yards from his hiding place he stopped where a huge dead tree leaned precariously on a smaller living one. Throwing off his sack of food, Rainsford took his knife from its sheath and began to work with all his energy. The job was finished at last, and he threw himself down behind a fallen log a hundred feet away. He did not have to wait long. The cat was coming again to play with the mouse. Following the trail with the sureness of a bloodhound came General Zaroff. Nothing escaped those searching black eyes. No crushed blade of grass, no bent twig, no mark, no matter how faint in the moss. So intent was the Cossack on his stalking that he was upon the thing Rainsford had made before he saw it. His foot touched the protruding bow that was the trigger. Even as he touched it, the general sensed his danger and leaped back with the agility of an ape. But he was not quite quick enough. The dead tree, delicately adjusted to rest on the cut living one, crashed down and struck the general a glancing blow on the shoulder as it fell. But for his alertness, he must have been smashed beneath it. He staggered, but he did not fall, nor did he drop his revolver. He stood there, rubbing his injured shoulder, and Rainsford, with fear again gripping his heart, heard the general's mocking laugh ring through the jungle. Rainsford, called the general, if you are within the sound of my voice, as I suppose you are, let me congratulate you. Not many men know how to make a melee man-catcher. Luckily for me, I too have hunted in Malacca. You are proving interesting, Mr. Rainsford. I'm going to go now to have my wound dressed. It's only a slight one, but I shall be back. I shall be back. When the general, nursing his bruised shoulder, had gone, Rainsford took up his flight again. It was flight now, a desperate, hopeless flight that carried him on for some hours. Dusk came then darkness, and still he pressed on. The ground grew softer under his moccasins. The vegetation grew ranker, denser. Insects bit him savagely. Then, as he stepped forward, his foot sank into the ooze. He tried to wrench it back, but the muck sucked viciously at his foot as if it were a giant leech. With a violent effort, he tore his feet loose. He knew where he was now. Death Swamp and its quicksand. 
His hands were tight closed as if his nerve were something tangible that someone in the darkness was trying to tear from his grip. The softness of the earth had given him an idea. He stepped back from the quicksand a dozen feet or so and, like some huge prehistoric beaver, he began to dig. Rainsford had dug himself in in France when a second's delay meant death. That had been a placid pastime compared to his digging now. The pit grew deeper. When it was above his shoulders, he climbed out and from some hard saplings cut stakes and sharpened them to a fine point. These stakes he planted in the bottom of the pit with the points sticking up. With flying fingers he wove a rough carpet of weeds and branches, and with it he covered the mouth of the pit. Then, wet with sweat and aching with tiredness, he crouched behind the stump of a lightning-charred tree. So this rising action is really building now. Um, the general is close to um, Rainsford. At one point, he even finds him up a tree, but blows a smoke ring at the air, laughs and walks away. He's playing with him uh, and then eventually finds him again. And Rainsford makes a trap called a Malay man catcher where like a, a log comes down and smashes them. Um, and he actually hits General Zaroff in the shoulder with this. Zaroff has to go home and fix his wounds. Now, again, there's lots of uh, imagery um, talking about nature and, and darkness and stuff here. Knight found him leg weary with hands and face lashed by the branches. Um, there's also allusion to this thing. I've played the fox, now I must play the cat of the fable. In the fable, cat and the fox, they argue about who's the smartest, who knows the most tricks. A hunter comes. Uh, the cat immediately just runs up a tree. The fox is like, uh, uh, what trick do I use? Moral of the story, common sense is more important than cunning. Um, essentially, the argument op op opposite to General Zatarov, that uh, instinct is actually better than uh, logic and reason. Um, the, only the devil himself, you know, they're comparing Zaroff to a devil, which is really good. Lots of personification in the story. An apprehensive knight crawled slowly like a wounded snake. Now, this is important because even using the adjective wounded here uh, kind of alludes to this idea of being a wounded animal. And that, you know, Rainsford is really starting to empathize with that that he kills now, and that, that he hunts. Um, this fear is on him at the beginning. He's like, things that are hunted don't feel fear. And he is starting to feel this fear. So he's really empathizing with that. Um, it, then it was at that moment that Rainsford knew the full meaning of terror, is what he says. Um, so yeah, like I say, he began to uh, um, work and build this trap, which does hit Rainsford, uh, does hit Zaroff. Um, Again, lots of describe, lots of imagery. The vegetation grew ranker, denser, in, ex, bit him savagely. Personification: the muck sucked viciously. So he gets caught by um, the quicksand, as if it were a giant leech. Similarly, there, um, he's stuck in this quicksand. Why might that be important? Remember, early on, earlier on in the story, uh, General Zarov actually said someone got stuck there. So he begins dig in now. And there's allusion to the war because he says, you know, Rainsford had dug himself in France, which would have been during the war. Um, and now he's saying, you know, being in the war is nothing compared to this. It's a placid pastime alliteration. There is a placid pastime compared to physically digging for his life now as he has to dig out of quicksand. He knew his pursuer was coming. He heard the padding sound of feet on the soft earth, and the night breeze brought him the perfume of the general's cigarette. It seemed to Rainsford that the general was coming with unusual swiftness. He was not feeling his way along foot by foot. Rainsford, crouching there, could not see the general, nor could he see the pit. He lived a year in a minute. Then he felt an impulse to cry aloud with joy, for he heard the sharp crackle of the breaking branches as the cover of the pit gave way. He heard the sharp scream of pain as the pointed stakes found their mark. He leaped up from his place of concealment. Then he cowered back. Three feet from the pit, a man was standing, with an electric torch in his hand. "'You've done well, Rainsford,' the voice of the general called. "'Your Burmese tiger pit has claimed one of my best dogs.' "'Again!' You score. I think, Mr. Rainsford, I'll see what you can do against my whole pack. I'm going home for a rest now. Thank you for a most amusing evening. At daybreak, Rainsford, lying near the swamp, 
was awakened by a sound that made him know that he had new things to learn about fear. It was a distant sound, faint and wavering, but he knew it. It was the baying of a pack of hounds. Rainsford knew he could do one of two things. He could stay where he was and wait. That was suicide. He could flee. That was postponing the inevitable. For a moment he stood there thinking. An idea that held a wild chance came to him, and, tightening his belt, he headed away from the swamp. The baying of the hounds drew nearer, then still nearer, nearer, ever nearer. On a ridge, Rainsford climbed a tree. Down a watercourse, not a quarter of a mile away, he could see the bush moving. Straining his eyes, he saw the lean figure of General Zaroff. Just ahead of him, Rainsford made out another figure whose wide shoulders surged through the tall jungle weeds. It was the giant Ivan, and he seemed pulled forward by some unseen force. Rainsford knew that Ivan must be holding the pack in leash. They would be on him any minute now. His mind worked frantically. He thought of a native trick he had learned in Uganda. He slid down the tree. He caught hold of a springy young sapling, and to it he fastened his hunting knife, with the blade pointing down the trail. With a bit of wild grapevine, he tied back the sapling. Then he ran for his life. The hounds raised their voices as they hit the fresh scent. Rainsford knew now how any animal at bay feels. He had to stop to get his breath. The baying of the hounds stopped abruptly, and Rainsford's heart stopped too. They must have reached the knife. He shinned excitedly up a tree and looked back. His pursuers had stopped, but the hope that was in Rainsford's brain when he climbed died, for he saw in the shallow valley that General Zaroff was still on his feet. But Ivan was not. The knife, driven by the recoil of the springing tree, had not wholly failed. Rainsford had hardly tumbled to the ground when the pack took up the cry again. Nerve, 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 he panted as he dashed along. A blue gap showed between the trees dead ahead. Ever nearer drew the hounds. Rainsford forced himself on toward that gap. He reached it. It was the shore of the sea. Across a cove he could see the gloomy gray stone of the chateau. Twenty feet below him, the sea rumbled and hissed. Rainsford hesitated. He heard the hounds. Then he leaped far out into the sea. When the general and his pack reached the place by the sea, the cassock stopped. For some minutes he stood regarding the blue-green expanse of water. He shrugged his shoulders. Then he sat down, took a drink of brandy from a silver flask, lit a cigarette, and hummed a bit from Madame Butterfly. General Zaroff had an exceedingly good dinner in his great paneled dining hall that evening. With it, he had a bottle of Paul Roger and half a bottle of Chambertin. Two slight annoyances kept him from perfect enjoyment. One was the thought that it would be difficult to replace Ivan. The other was that his query had escaped him. Of course, the American hadn't played the game. So thought the general as he tasted his after-dinner liqueur. In his library he read, to soothe himself, from the works of Marcus Aurelius. At ten he went up to his bedroom. He was deliciously tired, he said to himself, as he locked himself in. There was a little moonlight, so before turning on his light, he went to the window and looked down at the courtyard. He could see the great hounds, and he called, Better luck another time, to them. Then he switched on the light. A man, who had been hiding in the curtains of the bed, was standing there. Rainsford, screamed the general. How in God's name did you get here? Swam, said Rainsford. I found it quicker than walking through the jungle. The general sucked in his breath and smiled. I congratulate you, he said. You have won the game. Rainsford did not smile. I am still a beast at bay, he said in a low, hoarse voice. Get ready, General Zaroff. The general made one of his deepest bows. I see, he said. Splendid! One of us is to furnish a repast for the hounds. The other will sleep in this very excellent bed. On guard, Rainsford. He had never slept in a better bed, Rainsford decided. And that's it. That's the end of the story. So uh, Rainsford manages to make another trap, a Burmese tiger pit. You know, the ones where you dig up a big hole, you put spikes in it and you cover it with grass. And he kills Ivan doing this. Um, but he says things like, 
uh, he had new things to learn about fear. So he's really, really, really starting to empathize with being hunted, the hunty. Uh, at the end, the last one of the last things he says is, I am still a beast at bay. Uh, I'm still an animal who's being hunted. And this is a really important quote. He's He is a dynamic character. He has changed completely. He is a lot more empathetic to the hunted, whereas uh, General Zaroff is a static character. He doesn't change. And I find General Zaroff really interesting, actually. Um, look at, you know, think about the themes of this story. One thing that really pops out is what it means to be civilized and what it means to be uh, savage, if you will. And um, I find it really bizarre that, you know, General Zaroff is this very aristocratic, articulate, uh, cultured person. He drinks fancy wine, he eats fancy food, he uh, hums songs from famous operas like Man and Butterfly here. He's reading about, he's reading works from Marcus Aurelius. Um, he, he lives in this big castle with the best china, he has the best clothes, and yet he is a very uncivilized person by killing. So what's What's the message the author's trying to say about that, do you think? Uh, again, you know, the way the castle and the clothes are sometimes described are medieval and gothic in a way, which isn't very modern and civilised. So there's also that to consider as well. Um, but there we go. At the end, we can assume that uh, Rainsford kills General Zaroff as he had never slept in a better bed after General Zaroff says one of us will sleep in the bed and the other will be dog food. Uh, there's a lot more. There's some uh, literary devices on this page as well. The gloomy stone of the chateau. I quite like the gloomy grey stone, the alliteration making you focus on it and how the chateau is now described. It's gloomy. It's not this civilised beacon that it might have been. Uh, 20 feet below, the sea rumbled and hit. You know, definitely one of the major conflicts is nature, and we see that through the personification. Another conflict is obviously Rainsford versus Zaroff. Um, we have the nearer, nearer, ever nearer, the, the repetition there, really building the tension. Um, and this is the story. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a long one. It is the longest short story of the group, uh, but well done for finishing.